Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is Stackelberg competition. This is similar to Cournot competition with an important difference. Let's get to it. In Stackelberg competition, we still have firms competing over quantities. But unlike Cournot competition, the firms are not simultaneously choosing their quantities. Instead, they take turns. And specifically, in a duopolistic setting, with just two firms, we have firm one as a leading firm that begins the game by choosing a quantity of production Q1. Whereas with Cournot, firm two would simultaneously choose its output. Instead, firm two, under Stackelberg competition, sees firm one's quantity and then chooses its own quantity of production, Q2. Everything else is exactly as we've had it with Cournot competition. This will facilitate a direct comparison between Stackelberg and Cournot in later lectures. To recap, the prices are set by the market. They take the total quantity of production, Q1 and Q2, as its input, and then it outputs a price P. We're going to use that common functional form of some constant A minus that total quantity of production. We'll have firms with marginal cost of production CI greater than or equal to zero. And as always, the firms want to maximize their profit. And again, all they can do to do that is choose quantities of production, this time sequentially rather than simultaneously. How do we go about solving this? Well, we're going to use backward induction. If you're familiar with the standard game theoretical tools, backward induction means that we start at the end of the interaction, we figure out what is going to happen at that end of the interaction, and then we work our way upward. Specifically, that means here we will be solving for firm two's best response to any given quantity from firm one. And then once we've derived that piece of information, we will substitute firm two's best response function into firm one's optimization problem, and then solve for firm one's best quantity of production. This is analogous to a subgame perfect equilibrium. Whereas with Cournot competition, we were working with Nash equilibrium because the firms were moving simultaneously. Here, because they're moving sequentially, we have subgame perfect equilibrium as our solution concept. I want to highlight a subtle difference here between the solution strategy that we have for Stackelberg as compared to Cournot. Obviously, there is that big difference in terms of the solution concept being subgame perfection instead of Nash, but thinking about the actual logistics of doing these sorts of calculations. With Cournot, we take the first order conditions at the same time and then solve the system of equations to find the equilibrium. So we take a first order condition for firm one, take a first order condition for firm two, that gets us two equations with two unknown variables, and that means we can solve for those unknown variables because they are a system of equations. Stackelberg is not doing that. Stackelberg is taking a single first order condition to begin with, specifically firm two's first order condition. It is solving that first order condition. It is substituting that first order condition into a different optimization problem, and then it is taking another first order condition. And as we will see, this is going to result in a different solution than what happens if you take those first order conditions at the same time. So the outcomes of Stackelberg and Cournot are not going to be identical. Okay, now let's get to it. Let's go through that process, beginning with firm two's best response. We begin that by writing down firm two's optimization problem. So the first line of this slide is firm two's profit function which is the price times its quantity of production minus its marginal costs times its quantity of production. The second line is just doing some distribution to make the derivative a little bit easier. The third line takes the first order condition of the second line. In other words, we are taking the derivative with respect to Q2. That's because this is what firm two controls. Firm two controls Q2, its own quantity of production. We take that derivative with respect to Q2, and we set it equal to zero. And then we find, if we solve for Q2, that Q2 is equal to 
a minus q1 minus c2 all divided by 2. So that is the quantity of production that maximizes firm 2's payoff for any given quantity of production from firm 1, q1. And of course, we have this caveat here that this quantity needs to be positive, otherwise firm 2 would just produce 0. This caveat is going to recur in a moment just to have a little bit of precision in what is happening with our solution. But now that we have firm 2's best response, we can take that and substitute it into firm 1's optimization problem. On the first line, we have firm 1's objective function, that is its profit. In other words, it is the price times firm 1's quantity of production minus its marginal's cost times its quantity of production. And the key thing here is that unlike with firm two, firm one is going through this process and it's thinking ahead and it is reasoning what firm two will be doing in response to any given production on its own end. And it knows that the way firm two responds to any given level of production is to produce A minus Q1 minus C2 divided by two. So we substitute that quantity for Q2 into that first line, which gives us our second line. So why are we doing this, thinking about the general idea behind backward induction? Well, firm one, when it is producing a quantity, needs to be thinking into the future about how much firm two is going to be producing in response to that. And so whatever firm one is going to do, it needs to be maximizing its profits given what firm two is going to be doing to respond. And because we know what firm two is going to be doing in response, we can use that information in its objective function up front. That's why we do backward induction, because once we have that piece of information about firm two, it makes firm one's optimization problem very easy to handle. Going from line two to line three, I'm just doing a little bit of simplifying to make the derivative simpler. And then from there, we can take the first order condition. In other words, we can take the derivative of line three with respect to Q1. That's because this is what firm one controls. It controls its own quantity of production Q1. So we take the derivative with respect to Q1 and we set it equal to zero. And then if we solve for Q1, we get Q1 equal to A plus C2 divided by two minus C1. That is what's going to maximize firm one's optimization problem. This is what produces the most profit for firm one. Okay, so you might think that we're done in terms of actually understanding what is going to happen in equilibrium. That is true to some extent. We know the equilibrium strategies. We know that firm one will produce what you see on your screen here. And if we go back to the previous slide, we know what firm two's best response is to any given quantity of production. And if you know the technical details behind subgame perfect equilibrium, you not only need to be able to say what will happen when the players play the game, but also what would happen anywhere else. So here, this is giving us that anywhere else part. This is telling us not only what firm two will do in equilibrium, but also what firm two will do in response to any given quantity of production from firm one. But this doesn't yet tell us exactly what firm two is producing when they play the game because this is a value that is a function of Q1. And we, of course, we know what Q1 is from having done firm one's optimization problem. So we can take this quantity Q1 and substitute it into what was on the previous slide, and that will actually give us what firm two's equilibrium quantity of production is when they play the game. So just recapping, we know Q2 as a function of Q1 is A minus Q1 minus C2 divided by two and firm one's quantity of production, not as a function of any other endogenous value, but just of the primitives, A, C1, and C2. Well, that quantity of production is equal to A plus C2 divided by two minus C1. Well, if you're thinking about that first line, that first line has the value Q1, so we just substitute it. And if we do that, and we do a little bit of simplifying, we get that the equilibrium quantity that firm two will produce is A divided by four minus three fourths C2 plus C1 divided by two. And as you'll recall from the earlier derivation of firm two's quantity of production, we need this quantity in particular to be greater than zero for us to land in the interior solution. 
That was a little bit of a technical point, but by and large, this is a pretty straightforward process. Again, we just take firm two's optimization problem, we work through it, we find what firm two will do as a function of firm one's quantity of production, we substitute that into firm one's optimization problem, and then we optimize that optimization problem, and then we're done. So that wraps up the technical details in solving for the Stackelberg competition equilibrium. The next question then becomes, how does this actually look? What's happening here? How does this compare to Cornell? And we'll answer that later on. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope to see you next time. Take care.